This is The Speaking Show. I'm David Newman, and you're tuned in to the number one podcast for speakers, consultants, and experts who want to speak more profitably. My guest today, the awesome and amazing Shell Broadnax, who is just an international woman of mystery, <laughs> founder of Risa, and we'll hear more about that and the RisaCon, real estate staging guru, author, speaker, like I said, international woman of mystery, Swiss Army Knife. Welcome to The Speaking Show. Thank you. And actually, I do have a Swiss Army Knife, and I actually carry it with me quite often. <laughs> How did I know that? How you gotta, you gotta that? be prepared. It actually fits in my saddlebag real nicely, and you just have to have it out when you're on a trail because you never know when you're gonna need it. I love it. Absolutely right. And um, we'll also talk about your book a little bit, the Becoming Cowgirl, Becoming Cowgirl book. And we'll talk about home staging and all kinds of other fun stuff. Let's start with kind of your professional journey because it's, you know, the long and winding road always makes perfect sense in hindsight. What were all the professional adventures along the way to what you're doing today? And then we'll talk about what you're doing today and how all of that fed into it. Absolutely. And great question. Because let me tell you, my past, I started working when I was 16 years old. And the first time I tried to work, I was about 15 and a half. I walked into a company called the Energy Clinic. And that was a solar company back in the 80s before the uh, tax rebates were taken away from everybody and everybody was buying solar. It's not a new thing, people. We did it in the 80s, just so everybody's clear. It was very, very, very hip back then. I walked into this company. My mom happened to work there and I walked into what we called a phone room and it was literally people on dial phones, picking them up, sitting and chain smoking at their desks and making little tick marks on paper, calling people one after the other to smile and dial, smile and dial for hours of the day and trying to book uh, solar appointments for solar reps. And so I went in and I just made a comment to one of the salesmen. I said, I don't know why they're saying it that way. Why would she say it that way? That's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. She should do this, that, or the other. And so I opened my face at 15 and a half years old and lo and behold, everything that I thought came out. And the guy just looked at me and said, oh, really? you think you're all that, do you? You really think you can do that? These people are feeding their families and they're twice your age. What What do you know? And I'm like, well, I think I could do a better idea because I bet you can't do a better idea. I give you five phone calls. You won't do it. And I looked over at my mom and my mom looked up at the guy and she's like, you have no idea what you just got yourself into, guy. And I said, seriously, mom, can I take this bet? Because he bet me $100. I couldn't do it. My first phone call, I booked the appointment with Lauren Green from Bonanza. And the guy did just that, just what he did. He's like, that, that, I'm like, there you go. And he said, oh, that's beginner's luck. I bet you can't do it again. I'm like, double or nothing because I need a new pair of shoes. And he said, yeah, I'll give you double or nothing. I walked out with 300 bucks. I booked four out of five appointments, 15 and a half years old. I had a job. They wouldn't let me start. They hired me, obviously, but said, you can't start for six months. You needed work permits back then. And uh, that's how it kind of started. And I immediately you know, got into a supervisory role within a year and everything just kind of started taking off. And I started out in student loans where I became a private investigator, tracking down people that owed debt. And uh, then I moved into the rental car damage industry, being a private investigator for that as well. And then kind of once you get to the point where there's nothing you can't find, there's no stone that you can't unturn and you find everything, it's no longer a challenge. So I got out of it and got into the staging industry. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. So now let's fast forward. You're in the home staging industry and you're out there as a home stager. No, no, oh, I started. Uh, no, actually, I start. Nothing good could actually happen to your home if I come and stage it. So let me <laughs> say that up front. <laughs> so, not my forte. I can do it. Let me rephrase that. I can do it. I just don't enjoy it. I don't love it. It's not my passion, but building the businesses and mentoring the people, all of that is my passion. So I actually started out selling. A home staging training programs to people who wanted to become a home stager. And I was with that company for about six and a half years. And um, I just kind of got to the point where I'd done all I could do. The, the owner wasn't going to sell it. There was no more growth opportunity. So I left. And when I left, I did start a staging business and I had it for about four months. I had more business than I knew what to do with. And I couldn't stand going out and actually doing the actual staging work. 
So I thought to myself, what is it that I want to really do? What is it that I love to do? And the universe literally just threw start a trade association in my path. And so I did. And it's a nonprofit organization. I don't own it. It's something that's been very successful over the last decade. We've had thousands of people lend their time to, you know, their volunteer causes, a volunteer government to be able to make the industry a better place for those who work in it and to make staging be more well-known and understand for the homeowner and the real estate agents why staging works and how it benefits them. And so that was the beginning of the Real Estate Staging Association. That was it. Affectionately known as RISA. And when you say this just, it presented itself, how did it present itself to start the Trade and Professional Association for your entire industry? Great question. So way back then, we didn't have a trade association. We had one organization that I used to work for that had kind of an association set up, but it was only for their members. It didn't service the rest of the people in the pie. So I saw their little sliver and I saw the rest of this. And the feedback that I was getting, because I was well-known in the industry, I was literally being inundated with email after email. We need something for us. We need something to make to bring everybody together to have unity and to make us an actual industry. Because before we were very segmented, you know, somebody had a designation over here, this designation, and then this group of people had another one. And nobody was doing everything together with unity. And I said, you know, if you want an industry, you really have to be united. And that's how it started. And then you, because this is pretty big now, right? You've got what, yeah. two, 3,000 members? Yeah, we are sitting around 2,100, 2,200 members at any given time. Uh, we've been in business for over 10 years. Uh, we have an annual convention and a buying group and a couple other events during the year. And we have over 50 chapters nationwide. And there's a lot. Yeah, it's pretty big. And there's also your staging to sell program. That's got some continuing education. It does. I wrote a program called Staging to Sell What Every Agent Should Know. So anybody who's a real estate agent that needs to renew their license, they have to take X amount of continuing ed credits every year, every two years to renew their license. So I wrote the program and we have it approved in 17 different states. And we have over 50 instructors that teach the program and they teach it to real estate agents so they can get their continuing ed. And when you said that you don't own it, well, obviously, I guess no one owns a nonprofit, but you're on the board, you're the executive director. This is your full-time thing, correct? It's my full-time thing. I'm a paid CEO, so I'm not a voting board member because those are separated for checks and balances, but we have a volunteer board of directors. So yeah, theoretically, if I go rogue and I completely lost my mind, they could fire me, but we're hoping that I hold it together a little bit longer (laughs) and make sure that doesn't happen. And uh, yeah, so yeah, I don't own it, but we do work closely with the board of directors. So they help set the goals and the direction for the organization. And then the staff carries it out. So let's talk about the event. And we're going to go a little bit kind of behind the scenes here, right? Because as the executive director, as the CEO of the association, you and I first got connected. Well, first of all, you sent me a very kind note about uh, an email that I sent out. And you're like, David, we have to have you speak at our event. And we had some back and forth about that. And just, you know, for the record, it didn't work out because you chose this fantastic woman who's like the most successful woman real estate agent ever, correct? She has been named as Forbes' richest self-made woman in real estate. Absolutely. Right. Dottie Herman. There you Very go. Exciting. So clearly I, I couldn't compete with that. But the first lesson that I'll share with our listeners, and I'd love your take on this also, every time that I found out that I'm up against someone else, win, lose, or draw, it's always someone completely different. It's not like, oh yeah, we were evaluating 17 marketing speakers and 16 of the, you know, it's gonna be, you know, you wanna put butts in seats, you wanna have some name recognition, you want that person to deliver great value for your members, depending on where the association is or where the industry is, there's gonna be some topics that are more relevant and that are more in demand right now and different from last year and different from what's going to be hot next year and so forth. So when you think about speaker selection, and you've had some great speakers in the past too, because I know we talked about that and feel free to drop some names there as well. What is the speaker selection criteria among some of those things that I mentioned, what your members are asking for, industry trends, kind of having a name draw to put butts in seats, Walk us through sort of the mental checklist that as the CEO, you go through with speaker selection. Absolutely. Happy to do that. So we obviously, we pull our members and we need to know what the temperature is in our own industry. So for many years, we actually have had marketing experts before. And at that particular time, it made sense because the 
what I like to call the gripe of the industry was really about marketing and exposure. So we had him come on and he was great. We actually had him back a second time a couple of years later. And he was go in the ahead, running go, this go year. And, and, and share that name. We'll, let's give that person some love. David Avrin, visibility oh, coach. Avrin, Avrin, you're killing me here. He's, he's a buddy of mine. He's a buddy of mine. You're he, killing me here. He's awesome, right? He and really so is. I, he's great. I found him years ago and he's got a new book out too. And we are like, oh, this would be a good one. But it just, right now, it just didn't fit in. So that's totally. the one thing I really want speakers to know. I think a lot of times speakers, you know, you submit someplace and you don't get it. Don't be upset over it because it's exactly what you said. It's just that for whatever it was on this particular thing, it's just not the direction we were looking for. It doesn't mean that you weren't great. It just didn't fit into our particular program. So we pull our members every year and we do a lot of HDT celebrities over the years, which are a draw because they've got the name recognition. But over the years, you know, some they're great and some are what you would consider more talent. Like this last year, we had Vern Yip from Trading Spaces. He was amazing. He's an actual interior designer. He gave a lot of value to our members and they really learned something from him. So when we pull people say, do you really want a celebrity or do you really want somebody in business who's going to teach you something? Overwhelmingly, they said, you know, we'd want to learn something. We really want a takeaway instead of, you know, the celebrity photo op type of a thing. So if we can find both, it's great. But this particular year, we went with Dottie Herman and uh, it was a great selection. We're excited to have her, but we just kind of look at what, how everything fits into whatever the current gripe is of your particular industry and, and hope that it makes a good fit. What a great nugget. I mean, everyone's takeaway. And thank you for putting that in such a great soundbite about what's the gripe of the industry. Yeah. If you guys don't know the gripe of your industry, you're going to have a very hard time with that relevance piece. Exactly. Right? You got to have your finger on the pulse. Because you obviously do this for the association all year, not just for the convention. What strategies do you use to keep your finger on the pulse and keep your ear to the ground, not just to find the gripe of the industry, but sort of the wants, the needs, the hopes, the dreams, the trends? How do you do that listening campaign for your own tribe of people that are in the association? Well, I will have to say this for our tribe, it'd be hard not to listen to them (laughs) because they're kind of loud. It's not difficult. It really is not difficult. We have a large social media following. So all of our staff are in all the groups. So we can see day-to-day conversations that people have. I personally do coaching with stagers. So at any given time, a member, if they have a question, they literally can pick up the phone and get me on the phone and I will spend a few minutes talking to them. So I am very, very hands-on And uh, we are just very involved and we have chapters throughout the U.S. and Canada. So with over 50 chapters, five people on each chapter as a board member, then plus your members, our staff is really, really in tune with the people every single week of what's going on in the industry. So yes, but uh, you might not be giving yourself enough credit. A lot of people have those conversations yet do not connect the dots about, oh, this should be what we're our podcast is about, oh, we should have an article in a newsletter about this. Oh, we should have a track at the conference about that. And, you know, obviously you're very in tune with your folks because you are one, you coach them, you consult with them, you help them throughout the year constantly. But I think a lot of us, even if we have private clients that are in that industry, we fail to connect the dots up until now, because now we're, we're going to connect the dots more so than in the past. Now, I also saw on the website, you've got something kind of new and it sounds cool. It sounds kind of spacey, edgy, Star trek What are the Risa Edge events? Oh, the Risa Edge events are a one-day event that is a little bit more than a chapter meeting, but not anywhere near a Risa Con or even a Risa Connect event. So we have three events that we do throughout the year. So a Risa Edge is going to be more about two to three speakers, a luncheon, or maybe a breakfast instead. And it's just kind of in and out, down and dirty, less than a day event, mostly just for your local area. There's probably not going to be a lot of people flying in for them. And then we have a Risa Connect event, which is another one-day event, but is a really full, robust event. And then we're partnering with the different furniture markets, one in Toronto and then one in Atlanta as well. And then we go on a tour with the different vendors that uh, stagers buy wholesale from. So the Risa Edge events are local or are they national in scope? Do you market those nationally? Well, they're marketed more locally. So we might have like a Risa Connect in Toronto. So Primarily, everybody in the Ontario area went to that. 
maybe a couple other people from outside went. And then we had one in Texas. Mostly people in Texas are going to go. Sure, there could be one or two that fly in for it, but it's mostly a local event. Hey, this interview is a real moneymaker. If you're serious about ramping up your reach and revenue as a speaker, trainer, or expert, book a confidential speaker strategy call with our team. The link is doitmarketing.com slash call. It will be the most valuable 45 minutes you invest in your speaking-driven business. Speaking of value, let's get back to the show. Now, another thing I want to ask you about, because A, starting your own association is very brave. And in this climate, there's a lot of talk at ASAE and a lot of the association industry publications just about the state of associations in this country. People say, oh, everything is online. Everything is virtual. People don't see the value, or some people, sadly, so says this gripe. Oh, they don't see the value of getting together in person anymore. And you see some associations thriving and growing, and you know, you're know you already 10 years into this, and it seems to be growing by leaps and bounds. Other associations are dying on the vine. And you look at the, well, what are they doing with meetings? Same thing that these guys are over here. What are they doing with member engagement? Same thing these guys are doing over here. What do you think separates the associations who are on the upswing and growing and healthy from the ones that are dying on the vine and struggling with member retention and recruiting and engagement? Mm. Well, without specifics, it's really hard to comment. But in generalities, it's you really just have to hone in what's working, what's not. You know, you got to do that autopsy on every one of your programs. What works, what doesn't work, what are we going to do better next time? And then really engaging your members. Every single thing we do at RISA has typically come from a member idea a want, a need. We, you know, when you go to room to real estate, you have buyers wants and needs. We have members wants and needs. Right. And we ask them and we do pull our members and we are just very in tune and we're just always in the middle of it. So we actually see what they're needing. And a lot of people, they don't even know what it is that they need, but we see the types of things they're talking about. And because I've been in the industry so long, our team can say, you know what? It was even like in the beginning with Risa. Let me just backpedal. Originally, when I founded Risa, Nobody came to me and said, Shell, we need you to start a trade association. But it was, we need unity. We need togetherness. We need some standards. We need a way to network together. We need a way to all get out the word out. We need to be speaking about these things all the same way. So with all that information, I knew, oh, you want a trade association. And so that's how that was formed. So we, it's just really about listening and, and evaluating your programs and services. We also have committees that are formed from the members. So we have an awards committee. Look at our awards process that we give every year. What don't you like about it? What could be better? Do you have a different idea? And then that committee of people work on it throughout the year and then put a report back to us at the headquarters. And then we can look at what they've done and we can say, okay, this is what we can do. This is what we can't do because it's not possible of logistics or budget or whatever. And then we can help them tweak it and we come out with a great new program. And we just actually did that this year. We're going to have a new award for luxury staging this year. And we never had it before, but that's a result of the committee, them telling us what they need. I want to ask you next about that connection because you mentioned that some of your client work informs what the association should be doing. How has some of your association work on behalf of RISA raised a little red flag or green flag in this case and said, you know, I should offer this to my coaching clients. I should offer this to my private clients. So how does it kind of backflow in that the uh, ideas on the association side say, I think I need to have a new program or a new training or a new event just for your private clients around certain issues or certain trends? You know, it's funny you ask that because we actually had something that uh, I was with a group of women that are all members of the association. And we were actually all speaking at an event in Canada a couple years ago. And we got an Airbnb. And through all of us sitting around talking and having this experience, we thought we need to hold a retreat. And we were going to do it ourselves for our own clients and whatnot. And for some reason, when we all put it together, we said, you know what, this really kind of makes a little bit more sense under the RISA umbrella. So we didn't even end up taking advantage of it. We all volunteered our time to go on a retreat but we had held a private retreat for 11 people and we got an Airbnb. And that was something we can do on our own. But we kind of did it through Risa and that was a, a success as well. And um, that was a fee. So the members paid to be part of the retreat. Yeah, the members paid to be part of a retreat just like they would a convention. And it was a higher dollar. It was like $2,500 a person instead of you know, $450 for a convention ticket. 
And uh, it was two and a half days in an Airbnb in Florida. And it was structured. We all taught our own individual classes. We had six classes that we actually taught. And then we did one-on-one coaching. We broke up into groups. It was an amazing experience. So that was something that you know was a need in the industry. We could have done it on our own, but yet we decided just to keep it industry-related instead of breaking out on our own. Yeah, very smart. And I just love, it's like you've got the business is a laboratory for the association and the association is a laboratory for the business. Yeah. So it's kind of like a one plus one equals three kind of thing that I'm picking up. <laughs> there you go. Let's go back to speaker selection, speaker marketing, because obviously you're a speaker yourself and you go out and you speak and you get hired. When a speaker wants to connect with you for mm-hmm. future RISA events, some people say, okay, call them on the phone send a postcard, send a copy of your book over the transom unsolicited, uh, hit them on LinkedIn, hit them. I mean, all these sound terrible, but you know, we have this kind of batch and blast mass marketing. You know, I'm going to contact Shell and Sue and Fred and Mike, and I'm just going to you know, make 10 contacts today. And it's like copy, paste, send. My advice is <laughs> that's not smart. What would your advice be if people want to connect with you As the CEO of your specific association, what is the best approach slash sales process that you would welcome and that would not turn you off or make you go, uh, no? I prefer to get speaker submission via email. I do answer my phone, uh, but sometimes when somebody calls, if it's not a great time, it's kind of hard to get them off. So if you do make a phone call, always stating, is this a good time to connect? So we don't have to cut you short as a speaker. But when I get them in an email, because I'm a speaker as well, so I get that you know it's a numbers game and that people have a tendency to just copy and paste and send and send and send. But it's a numbers game, but let's make those numbers a little bit sweeter and slant it a little bit more towards your side as a speaker where do your research about where you're going to be speaking. Who is your audience? Because you can have your template that you copy and paste But if you're not switching out some words, and when you do switch out the words, make sure it's done correctly because if you leave one out, then people know you're just switching out the words. Do your research a little bit. I've seen a few speakers recently send some video messages, which I thought were actually kind of cool. So video email, things like bomb. A video email, yeah. Sending a little snippet, you know, hey, you know, this is me and this is what I'm like. You can, you know, see it, touch it, feel it type of a thing. So I like the little video blurb that you can get from people, but just submitting via email and exactly what we're looking for. So for me, one of my biggest peeves, should I say, when I'm accepting speaker proposals from professional speakers is for them not to put their speaker fees. I understand. However, when I'm having to take this to a committee and sometimes budget is an issue, it's an important factor that we need to know. Because if there's somebody that is absolutely out of our budget, I don't want to fall in love with them and then know that there's nothing that I can do about it. So... Keeping that all together. For sure. What I was going to say, not to be cynical or mean, sometimes speakers don't put the fee into the email because speakers don't know what their fee is or don't know what the fee should be. So I remember very clearly the client came to me and was totally confused before our work together. She says, David, you know, I I, I just don't know. In the last 12 months, I've been paid 1500 and I've been paid 15000 I don't know where my fee actually should be. You tell me. 15,000. <laughs> well, yeah, exactly, exactly, right? But imagine that statement, right? I don't know, 1,500, 15,000, you tell me. If you're that disconnected from your own marketplace value, you got a serious problem. Absolutely. So let's talk about that kind of the range of speakers because I, yeah. I talk to a lot of folks like you, conference producers, association executives, and so forth. There seems to be kind of a a preconceived notion or even from a track record of experience, when you hire speakers below the $5,000 level, hire speakers between five and 10, hire speakers between, let's say, 10 and 15, and then the fourth tier is like 15 plus all the way to many hundreds of thousands of dollars, depending on what your reality show is, or if your last name happens to be presidential, you know, you could go crazy on this. But within those layers that you have hired speakers, right? Low, medium, high, medium, and then the superstars are like 25, 30,000. Have you noticed any pattern of where's the sweet spot? Where's your best bang for the buck? Do you have the most success where you're like, man, that person was totally worth that fee, whether the fee was in any of those four layers. Talk to yeah. me. 
Absolutely. So at Resacon, we divide up our sessions for three speakers at a time. So I tend to like to, it's kind of like a jigsaw puzzle when you're putting it all together in an event. So I want something for newbies, mid-level stager and advanced stager all writing at the same time or a niche, a niche topic that I kind of put in. So that's kind of my formula for that. But on the same note, over the last few years, we have actually hired speakers to do our sessions where previous years, it was only stagers teaching other stagers about something. But now our industry's grown. So now we have more stagers that are in the advanced part of their career and they want to know things about finance and assets and 401ks and those type of things. So for those speakers to do my sessions, I look for the average local business person, somebody who is not working on a global scale for their clients, but they want your average individual business person, like a coach or something along those lines. And that's usually around a thousand to $2,500 speaker level. So if you're running a coaching business and you're coaching on something that's very specific, those speakers tend to charge about 1500 bucks to go in somewhere for an hour or two for a small session. Those work really, really well. And they're vested in it. And then the good news about that is even though they might not be on a, a global company like a Hertz rental car global name, they can actually, through a video messaging like we're doing now and the internet, they can actually do coaching one-on-one kind of like what we're doing it. So it actually benefits them because they might pick up a client or two. And then you've got some other speakers that are the higher speakers. And, and that's, is that a breakout? Just to be clear, that's a breakout session yeah, that we're giving them for that $1,500 to $2,000 range. Yes. Okay. So then you've got, you know, other speakers that are much more expensive. And we've gotten speakers where I've called and say, you know, what's your speaker fee? And it's like 80 grand. I'm like, don't like to speak much, do you? And so, no, I would never pay $80,000 for speakers. Even if I got two of them at a time and they were really cute, I wouldn't do it because I just think it's just irresponsible. And literally you're going to have to you're not only going to have to teach me something, you're going to have to hold my hand and probably fly to my house and help me do something for 80 grand. Right. So it just wouldn't be feasible to do that. So for a major keynote for Risa, what we looked, you know, anywhere between the 10 to $15,000 mark seems to be a really nice sweet spot for us. I've gone higher than that in the past. It made me had heart palpitations. And you know, you, cause here's the thing is that when you hire somebody, you have to actually pay them. And that means you have to raise the money to do it, which means more ticket sales or more vendor sales, sponsorship. So you have to kind of go out there in order to do it. So it's just a really, it's a big balancing act. Yeah. The best speakers that you've worked with in this particular arena, I'm about to ask you, which is the ones that have really helped you with the marketing, the ones that have helped you with putting the butts in seats, getting extra attendance, getting extra vendors, getting extra advertising or sponsors or exhibit. You guys have exhibit space, right? Yeah, we do. So people that are helping you fill your marketplace, what can a speaker do who's listening to us right now that says, I don't want just my session or my keynote to be a success. I want to help Shell make this entire event a success. And months and months before the event happens, I'm going to help her recoup my speaker fee so that my fee is like, oh my God, this guy got another 30 attendees at whatever, $1,500. They helped me land a big sponsor for 20 grand. They got us four extra trade show booths because they did something to yeah. help you market the event, pre-market the event. What are some ideas that you've either seen speakers offer you or that you've asked them to do to help you in this area? Great question. Uh, what I've been doing with our speakers is I interview them, kind of like what we're doing today. I have a show called Stager Talk. And so every speaker, even the session speakers, come on an episode of Stager Talk. So we do 30, 45 minutes, a little bit about their session, what it's going to bring to the table. We also have social media graphics. So we do ask them to go ahead and share it on their channels as well. But in a special video message, a one-on-one, -on -one, a 30-second, 60-second video message, Hi, I'm this great speaker. I can't wait to speak to you at Resacon. I'm going to solve all your problems and a bag of chips while you're there. Please come out and see me. Let's get that out on social media as well. And then we can also use that in email blasting. So the direct communication from that actual speaker really goes a long way. And then something else that's really important that I think that a lot of speakers I have resistance to, and I, as a speaker, I 100% understand the resistance. However, you're getting paid $10,000 or more with a nonprofit company where these hundreds of people are coming primarily and they want to see you stay for a photo op. 
and don't limit it because most of the speakers limit it to 20 to 25 people. And I get why I get it. I understand why, but when you've got hundreds that were there and all these people are just dying for a photo with you so they can put on their social media, that means the world to people. And it's that extra little added touch. It's a value add that any speaker can do. And as an event planner, you have to make it quick. So I've got that system down as well, where we form a line and it's boom, walk up, smile, shoot, boom, walk up, smile, shoot, next. And you move them in like you're herding cattle. And it works, but that's a nice ad for somebody to do. Super quick commercial break. Isn't this interview amazing? If you'd like to get more ideas on how to start or grow your speaking business fast, pop over to our free training at doitmarketing.com slash webinar. Let's talk about after the event, because, and I'm sure you've noticed this as a speaker. I'm not sure if you're guilty of it as a meeting planner. I know when I do my events, I can be guilty of this as a meeting planner. Before the event, the speaker emails or calls or, hey, Shell, quick question about whatever. We get back to them like nobody's business. (laughs) The second the event is over, you start looking at your chair. It's like, am I dead? Is this like the Sixth Sense movie? Like, am I really here? Your voicemail goes in a black hole. Emails go unanswered for weeks. They loved you. Don't get me wrong. It's not like it was a train wreck. They love you, but they're either so busy or they're so behind because of all the event planning that led up to the event. What can and should a speaker do right after the event that would help you extend the value of the event to the members that were there and then make the members that missed it say to themselves, oh my gosh, I can never afford to miss another event because that sounded awesome. So what's a good follow-up strategy that you would like to activate your speakers to help you with to either tie a ribbon around the last event or get people salivating for the next event? You know, I think a follow-up video message from the speaker is always a great add-on that they can actually speak to the audience that we can distribute to our members. You know, thank you so much for having me. I learned so much. It was great being there. It's just a nice added touch, like a thank you card. I think a lot of times speakers want feedback. And I think that as an event planner, if we can give the feedback in a, you know, within two weeks, because that's usually when you poll everybody, you can get a good sense of everything within a couple of weeks to be able to give this feedback as well. And just for the speaker and the event venue themselves, just to have a really positive relationship. So it's great that we're all working together up up until, and then when the, the event goes, it's like now the relationship is over. Just to extend even you know the next couple of weeks, let's just stay in touch, a couple emails, niceties. That way, the event people, I'm remembering you as a speaker, that door is continually open. You can refer as a speaker. We can refer the speaker to somebody else. And it just kind of helps maintain a relationship. Do you value, and this is just a totally honest question, there's no right or wrong answer. And if it's no, it's cool, then it's a data point. I recommend that immediately after an event, a speaker reconnect with the person that hired them Mm -hmm. and said, Shell, just like you said, fantastic event. So great to be with you. Let me share with you two or three folks that you really have to take a look at for next year, because you're probably not going to use me two years in a row. But my buddy, David Averin, my friend, Heather Lutze, my buddy, Jeff Ram, these are all fantastic speakers, different from what I do. But if you love me, you will love them. Is that kind of thing welcome or are you like, listen, dude, I've got my own speaker thing going on. Thanks, but no thanks. How welcome is that? Oh my God, I'd be jumping up and down. That would be amazing. That I love. Especially since that one speaker, if you're going to refer someone else, you've already experienced the experience with us. So you understand the industry, the venue, myself, my staff. So you as a speaker have a really good insight that all your speaker friends that might be a good fit. And as long as it's a good fit recommendation, then absolutely. If it's somebody that you knew that there's no way it would be a good fit, you don't recommend them, but you recommend somebody else. I would love that. It's a lot when you're tracking down speakers and we have spreadsheet after spreadsheet. You can name a couple celebrities. I'll tell you right now how much they charge for speaker fees because we just, I keep track of it. And I always want to know because I also like to refer. I get people asking me too, you know, who do you know as speakers? And I can say, you know what? I really wanted this person this year, but it didn't work out for one way or another, check out this person and I can refer them as well. So I love that. Awesome. Let's wrap up. I just got a couple of final questions for you. The final, final question will be, how can people get connected to Risa if they're interested in 
obviously the staging industry or just, you know, interested in what you're doing with this association, very innovative, kind of cutting edge fun stuff. Question before that final question is if folks were to take one central idea from our conversation today, what would you hope that would be? Oh boy. Uh, Give the people what they want. Give the people what they want. If you're running an association, really get in tune with your members and uh, do what you need to do. Now, let me preface this by saying, don't allow one or two people to bully you into doing something that they think is good because I've made that mistake. Don't ever, ever do that. I will come over. I will find you. I will smother you with a pillow if you do that as an event planner. I promise you, I'll be your accountability buddy on that. Don't ever do that. But when you see it, the same issues are popping up time after time after time. Give the people what they want. You can't fail if you're giving everybody what they want. The biggest problem we have right now with Resacon is people are complaining because they don't know which session to go to. And sorry, it's fantastic. It is what it is. You're going to have to decide. So right. divide up into people, have a team of people, break out you know, one go to each, come back, share your information. I think that is brilliant advice on both sides of the equation, both on the association meeting side and even on the speaker side is don't be so focused on what you want to sell be crazy focused on what they want to buy. Yes. Right? Because that's where the magic happens. All right. How do people connect to the awesome and amazing Shell Broadnax? Let's talk about your personal empire. Let's talk about your professional empire. We're going to link all of these up in the show notes as well. Great. Where can people go for more of your great stuff? For sure. So if you are interested in staging, real estate staging, finding a stager, anything staging related, just go to realestatestagingassociation.com. All my contact information there, everything in the world you'd ever want to know about staging. For me personally, I speak about the power of focus, how to learn the lessons that you're not learning and why you keep having the same things happen over and over. I have a new, my first speech that came out was called Becoming Cowgirl. I have a new one coming out. It's actually going to be an online class called Stop Kissing Frogs If You Really Want a Cowboy. And that is really teaching people how to stop making the same mistakes over and over and over when you really want to be doing something else. I've learned a lot. I'm actually a Robbins Madonna's trained life coach as well. So if you're interested in any of that, power, positive thinking, law of attraction, focus, becoming cowgirl, it's shellbroadnext.com. Fantastic. And we're going to link all of that up and your LinkedIn and all your social links and all kinds of good, fun stuff. So this was so awesome. Thank you for being on with us. We have to have you back. We'll have to have a a debrief sort of after the next big event. And uh, I just can't wait to see where you take this association. I'll tell you, it's very brave to be running an association, not just running it, but growing it in this climate. And you seem to be just going through and taking no prisoners. And it's a huge, huge success. Well, thank you. It's certainly a labor of love for sure. I've started actually, when I thought about this the other day, I've actually started four nonprofit organizations in my lifetime. And something that I really recently discovered about myself, my kind of my soul's purpose is really to lead people through leadership and unity and to, you know, gather people to do things for the greater good. And I've been really fortunate in my career that I've been able to do what it is that I like. And like I said, with four nonprofits, when you're constantly starting a nonprofit organization that benefits other people and doesn't benefit your own bottom line in your retirement pocket, You're either a little bit cuckoo or you're really loving your industry and what you're doing. So a little bit of both. Well, so last quick comment about that. You're a convener, right? People are coming in under your roof. So you're doing the impresario business model. I guess a cowgirl would probably call that wrangling. I'm wrangling. You're you're wrangling. You're wrangling the herd and (laughs) you are leading the herd. And that is totally awesome. I just love that impresario kind of convener mindset because I think the future of business is communities and you're building a big, beautiful community. Thank you. Well, I certainly love it. And uh, sounds like the people are too. There are retentions up, new memberships up, everything's up, everything's going great. And we're super excited for 2019. Well, that wraps up another episode of The Speaking Show. Hey, tell you what, if you like us, rate us and review us on iTunes. Subscribe, tell a friend. Go grab the notes and downloads and extras at thespeakingshow.com. See you next time.